Soraya. Welcome to episode 125. 125? Um, yes. Wow. Yeah, How'd that happen? I know, right? I was looking over a few of our past episodes and I realized that over a hundred episodes ago, almost two years to the day um, in March 2019, we spoke to Russ Tolman of True West, uh, the guitar player for True West, talking about his album, solo album, Goodbye El Dorado. Right. Um, well, two years later, over a hundred episodes later, we have Russ Tolman back. No better time than the present. Yeah. And why, why would we be talking to Russ now? Well, um, many of you could have noticed that we spoke recently with Gavin Blair. Yes, we did. And also, um, True West has a Legacy 3 CD collection. Um, and if you're a True West fan, a Russ Tolman fan, a Gavin Blair fan, or anyone else that's been in the band, um, you want this. And I'm, I'm really interested in hearing what's in that collection. I've already donated, but I want to know a little bit more about the project. So let's talk to Russ. Let's get it started. Oh, and who is our guest? Get, who is our guest? Co-host episode, yeah, co-host. Thank you. One of us, <laughs> one of us is working today. Yeah, yeah. So neither you nor I are True West experts, fans, yes, but experts by no means. Right. So we had to pull in our good buddy Ronnie Barnett uh, from the Muffs, who is actually considered to be a True West expert. So he's going to help us along on this discussion. Uh, and I don't know if you mentioned it, but uh, this three CD set, there's a Kickstarter campaign. Yeah. And when you mentioned that you donated towards it, that's what you're referring to. So thank you. Um, and we will provide the link. So, Jeff, let's get started. Hi, this is Soraya. And this is Jeff. Our podcast is called Paisley Stage Raspberry and Rhyme, a podcast where the two of us play music that we like and share anecdotes and background about the tunes. We hope you'll join our conversation. And without further ado, agroviar. Let's get groovy. Someone's knocking at the door. Somebody's ringing the bell. Someone's knocking at the door. Somebody's ringing the bell. Well, do me a favor, open the door and let him in. Hang on, folks. There we go. Hey, hey you two. Hey, we meet again here on Zoom. Yes, <laughs> yes. We need a true West expert. Just say, ah, uh, you know, I do my best. <laughs> someone's got to, uh, yeah, someone's got to do it. There we go. It's high noon, folks. It is. High noon. Sorry, high noon, True West. You get it, Russ? True West, high noon. <laughs> oh. I think high noon was your idea, Ryan. <laughs> it was. There he is. Hey. There Sorry I was delayed. Uh, it was uh, it took a little too long in hair and makeup. Oh. <laughs> Plus I had to download the app again because I haven't used Zoom in a while. and uh, uh. Never used it with the camera before, which is... Oh. So why would you say use it with the camera? <laughs> I mean, why Why not? Oh, never. Yeah. Usually Ronnie Barnett is the one that's hung up in hair and makeup. So oh. yeah, yeah, it's not bad today. I'm not, I'm kind of pleased here. You're looking Polite good. And, hey, you look good too, Russ. That, your Thank hair you. and makeup person earned their, earned their keep yeah, today. That's right. So. Yeah. What see. about the hosts? Nothing about the hosts? Hey, 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 please. We're, we're hired help, Jeff. Come on. <laughs> Stars. Stars. You guys well, always look good. That's a given. <laughs> <laughs> thank you sir thank you sir so russ we're welcome back to paisley stage raspberry and ryan thank you we were, video Sarai and I were just, yeah video now <laughs> we we're we're upgrading here it's really? going to be live before you know it so wow uh, um so sarai and i were just talking russ that it's was almost a hundred episodes ago just over two years wow. ago that we had you last to talk about goodbye el dorado so wow the time it it do fly 100 episodes <laughs> it doesn't is there not much you... to talk about <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what i always say yeah <laughs> yeah we we've we found some things unfortunately uh some members of the paisley underground are still chugging along and putting out some uh some excellent music and then there's lots of old stuff to cover too so yeah yeah we're, we're making it happen we're making it happen cool 
And one of the things, uh, talking about new releases, we're excited to hear that True West has a new project. And uh, Russ, yeah. please tell us about this we're, project. We're finally doing the definitive True West collection. It's going to be a three CD uh, produced by Pat Thomas, who a lot of folks know for his reissue producing work. And uh, it's going to have a beautiful multi-fold digipack, uh, I think four panels, 24 page booklet, uh, beautiful wow. art. And it's going to have all three studio albums, which are all long out of print. Uh, there's the first two that I'm on and then Hand of Fate, uh, which I'm not on, but has never been on CD before is going to be on there. Plus uh, some recently discovered demos that we didn't even know we had anymore. Plus a bunch of other stuff that may have shown up uh, on vinyl in you know 20 years ago, but is long past and, and a few other surprises. So it should be a very, very good set. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully the booklet is good because this guy down here, Ronnie, he's, he's a critic when it comes to booklets. So uh, hopefully it meets his standards. Okay. Yeah, run, run the graphics by me, Russ. Uh, before I you, will. Before you how, go to how press. Are you with, how are you with Adobe InDesign? <sighs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> you lost me now. I, I have no idea. Okay. Cork Express? <laughs> I, I, I'm not tech. You know, when I was young, my father, my own father told me, you're not very technically hung, are you? And uh, <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> but I'll figure it out, at, though. My techno he's member. Good at these it's very small. Yeah. <laughs> Ronnie's good at these, though. The 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 sum up, the sum down, right? Yeah. I'm good at proof. I'm good at proofreading. Actually, I catch a lot of mistakes that uh, friends. Uh, I won't name names, but on on things that have actually come out, I, I yeah. So. Editing is a is a good good skill to have. Yeah, and we should also say this is a Kickstarter project, so people yes, need it to, is. Uh, yeah, yeah, should should. Be very nervous because actually we're uh this morning i noticed we're 84 percent of the way there which is fantastic wow. but the last 16 percent are probably the hardest and we have i think 17 days to go from today which is uh who knows when this airs but uh uh yeah we don't we have a short time so if folks are interested hop in it's only 25 bucks plus five dollars shipping in the u.s and there's some other reward levels too, if you want to get crazy. You can even have us come play in your backyard uh, for a couple of grand plus uh, transportation. Wow. Very reasonable, Russ. I was very, I was impressed with that. I, I almost oh, want good. to book you in my house. Are yeah. you going to chip in? <laughs> oh, you already <laughs> did for that. Yeah. I already did. Yeah, yeah. Already... <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank uh, you. That's all three you have, and I appreciate it very much. Nice. I also want to say this is an all or nothing project. So we, we do need to get this funded or else we're not going to have this. So exactly. Thank you, Ronnie. Yeah. So please folks, uh, let's make this happen. So at least the three of us can have this. <laughs> <You're right>. <laughs> <laughs> I like one too. Four. Make that four. Yeah. There you go. So 25 bucks for three CD set is not bad at all. No, I it's think very nice. Good, good price. Yeah. yeah, you're cutting out the middleman, so there's no distributor markup, getting it direct from the source. It's sort of farm to CD player. Nice, <laughs> yeah. nice. You are stuck with some Pat Thomas liner notes, but you know, you can't have it, it can't be perfect, right? Yeah, well, sometimes he's good, especially <laughs> if you have somebody like Ronnie Barrett take a look at him before they go out. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I told Pat I'd have to get some jokes in about him, so. Oh, good. <laughs> well, we, we have that relationship. He has a good <laughs> sense of humor. Yeah, in all seriousness, how did Pat Thomas get involved with this project? I know he knows a lot about Paisley Underground. And, and he knows a lot about True West. Um, I first met Pat in Rochester first. No, no, I think it was the second time that we played in Rochester. He was doing college radio and he arranged to do an interview. So we rode over in the car together to the, to the radio station and we just talked to Blue Streak the whole time. He asked me every question and, you know, we it really just flowed and then when we got to the station we we're all tucked out and like we're on the air and it's like oh okay because he already knew the answer to everything already so it made for a very dull interview once if if only uh there had been a microphone in the car it would have been great so pat and i've known each other for years and we actually worked together at a uh, I had a label called Interstate that Pat was a partner in uh, from 1998 till about 2006 is when we were really active. The label still exists and uh, 
uh, for digital distribution of our catalog. But Pat and I worked together there and uh, that kind of turned into what happened is we started importing from, um, from Europe and uh, we shared a space with this other importer called Runt and pretty soon uh, the man that ran that, Filippo said, hey, you're doing the same thing as us. Why don't you just bring all your operations under my umbrella and you work for me and la di da And so we did that for quite a few years. And uh, so, yeah, we were doing reissues. You know, Runt moved into doing reissues and had the water label uh, for Men With Beards, uh, a few other. And uh, Pat did those labels and I did some uh, reissue uh, producing as well there. Nice. Right. I, I want to say uh, that was a great label and, and a lot of great releases, which are hard to find now. And a lot of them are quite expensive on the uh, market now. But uh, people should research Interstate Records because uh, yeah, it did good work, Russ. Yeah. Well, thanks. There's probably some products somewhere that we can break out of storage and, <laughs> and ruin the market <laughs> for you. <laughs> right. Uh, well, you know, as you know, we recently had Gavin on here, and we yes, kinda, I listened. We're not going to grill you on the whole True West history here. Well, but, uh, his version and my version are they diverge in a couple areas, so uh, <laughs> okay. uh, the things he remembers aren't quite what I remember. So you know, that's time oh. for you. Yeah. Well, let's 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 go back to the. Uh, what, what, uh, did you have bands before the suspects we'll get to the no suspects, suspects was my very very first band i you know it was the 70s and you had to be a, a virtuoso to play in a band in the 1970s you know i was a guitar player and I, and I was just kind of very insecure about it and punk rock and new wave came along and it kind of leveled the the playing field where anyone could be in a band so we started suspects steve Wynn actually we were both at the same radio station along with kendra and steve knew that I played guitar and he said, oh, come over to my place, we'll jam. Or actually he came to my house and we ended up playing the car song, uh, just what I needed over and over and over. And then he said, I want to start a band. He and Kendra had just seen Springsteen. And so they were all hot to start a band. So, you know, we got, Gavin already told the story of the, the ad in the uh, Cal Aggie where we got uh, both him and uh, bass player, Steve Sujol. And yeah, Suspects was my first time on stage. Except I was, when I was a teenager, a bass player in a polka band that never, ever oh. played out. It was accordion, <laughs> guitar, and I played bass. And uh, <laughs> the woman who played accordion sang. Uh, but we didn't ever get a gig, so. That's, that's the best way to get in a band is to play bass, because no one yeah, ever wants to play. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking from experience, it's right. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, do you have the suspect single there to hold up? I, it's buried. Mine, I so. can't find. I know I have, I have it, but I can't. I got it around here that. somewhere too. I'm walking, ta um, I'm walking, loud and talking proud, or whatever. I, uh oh, do you still oh, see Ed? me? I managed to uh, screw no. up my phone here. Uh, <laughs> no, we don't see you, but we can hear you. Uh oh, hold on. Let me get you. Yeah, I'm up. the one. I'm the one that's technically inept, right? <laughs> okay so that one can go away that one go i get rid of the calculator this is uh uh that one that one oh here we are there we go <laughs> there we go were you going to um davis uh the, the college at that point too yeah Rose? i did i i started davis in 76 and my whole plan was i was going to work in radio i'd i'd been weekend dj at a local station in my little podunk area. I grew up in Lake County, California, which is up in the sticks. And uh, I worked at the, you know, the local radio station doing weekends. They played uh, easy listening music from, from big automated tapes. And then you'd break in and do the news and such. And funny story is we used to play a lot of Enoch Light. And uh, so it was very fun to start meeting and playing with his grandson, John Clages, um, you know, here 30 years back. So, uh, and John's got a great new record coming up. If uh, if you haven't heard it yet, it comes out, uh, actually it comes out next month. Can you see oh. me? I can't see you. What do I do here? Uh, uh, there we can we see go. you. I got you. There we go. 
I'm yeah, back. or you can go gallery view, uh, Russ, and you can see all of us at once. So that's uh, another swipe to the left. On the on the yeah. on the left, yeah. uh, I he's think. using his phone. Nah, I'll just look at Ronnie. He's handsome. Okay, okay. Well, whoever talks is who you're going to see. So oh, okay, that's probably be me. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, most likely that's going to be Ronnie. <laughs> there you go. Hey. Okay, so you hung out the station. That's where you met Steve and Kendra. And yeah, kind of became yeah. Friends and Steve was very very pushy. It was like the very first time we met. I think I was training him on the board because I was program director at that time. And he said, oh, you're going to the coast this weekend with your girlfriend. Uh, hey, let's make it a double date. I was like, no, I don't know oh. you yet, dude. So <laughs> Steve was always, uh, you know, he, he always knew what he wanted and was ready to go after it. Nice. Wow. And that's where you met Gavin. So, so yeah. how did you, how did you, well, we'll get to the end. So suspects, as we learned from Gavin, played a laundromat and a couple of weird gigs. Yeah, we actually did a few. There was a, actually a club in Sacramento called Slick Willies that had been a biker bar, but they started doing uh, New Wave Night, I think, on Mondays. And this was the place. This place had the, the peanut shell floor, and it was actually quite a big room and nice stage. And we saw a lot of great people there. But we played there. And Steve and Kendra were underage, so they had to live in the dressing room the whole time until we could go on. Uh, it was fun. And we played we played more than just the weird campus gigs and stuff. We did actually play some out. I remember playing a show that somebody put together at a junior high school, and some girl in the in the front started taking off her clothes, which was quite um, entertaining. <laughs> Only down to her underwear. But how, well, I, I was going to ask how reception was generally, but it sounds like you got a good reception. Uh, that was that was pretty good, yeah. If they're taking off their clothes, yeah, it's a good sign. <laughs> um, so, so Steve and Kendra decide they want to move. Did they ask you to move? Did they want to keep yeah. the suspects going? Yeah, they did. At, at one point, you know, Steve was really gung ho, and and at, with, on, with retrospect, I realized we probably could have done something, but you know, my own natural insecurity thing. You know, oh, and I had a job at uh, a radio station then it, you know a commercial station and i i just didn't want to risk it moving down there not knowing what was going on um so they went off and and uh yeah eventually got to forming dream syndicate steve was in a couple other bands before that and i'm not sure what kendra did i guess just got better playing bass she had started playing bass in davis she was in a band called icon or the icons for a little while there along with suspects Wow. Oh, okay. And then you start writing songs. How, how did that, did that come yeah, by necessity? I, 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 or, uh, yeah. I was writing songs during the suspects time, but um, I don't think any, we did end up doing one or two of them. Um, but, uh, you know, generally I think Steve's songs at that point were better than mine. So, you know, and plus he was the <laughs> boss. So, you know how that works. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, okay. But uh, yeah, so between Suspects and, and True West, there was this band called Meantime, which kind of morphed into True West. So uh, it was me and this fellow named Sean O'Brien, who was the singer, and Rick Gates, who was the son of David Gates of Bread, was the bass player, and another oh, wow. fellow named Kevin B Vanderhoof on drums. And we actually did a, a little 45 EP, and some of that stuff was recorded. Uh, by David Gates at his studio uh, down here in uh, it was in Woodland Hills and uh, nice man that David Gates really sweet fellow um, it was so weird because you know I was maybe 22 or something 23 at the time and he seemed so old you know he was 40 and, you know and he had grown <laughs> kids you know Rick was his oldest kid in college and then he had a couple teenagers you know it, it was amazing how much that man had done and 40 short years because you know he had a whole career before bread as a session guy and as a ranger and uh he produced captain beefheart's early recordings all this really weird and diverse stuff that uh you don't imagine when you uh think of uh baby i'm a i'm a want you baby i'm a need you <laughs> that sounds like some good bonus tracks for the uh, true west set by the way the meantime uh, you know set. that's that stuff i it's 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 separate and it's actually come out i think on vinyl there's a guy up in sacramento has a record store called phono select and he has a label and he put out the just recently the meantime um vinyl he he 
expanded the uh, the EP and added some live stuff and turned it into oh. an LP. I think it's out. I, I have a test press and I haven't seen the final one yet. Wow, just big scoop for Paisley Stage right there. You yeah, guys. there you go. Yeah. Um, I need yeah. this meantime record. If yeah, you're okay. If you're a completist, you have to have that one. If you're a music fan, forget about it. Right. Oh, <laughs> so I'm sure it's good. I'm sure. Uh, there's some so, highlights. What was meantime uh, punkier, for, for lack of a better no, term? No, we were. You know, if you want to throw us in a box, you can throw us in the skinny tie mod box. Oh. And then we kind of started moving towards. Uh, you know, kind of Echo and the Bunny main gang of four that, you know, we were kind of young kids trying to figure out what it was that we were and where we were going. We actually played a show with gang of four and they said, oh, well, we don't want all your stuff on stage. Uh, just go ahead and use our, our bass amp, but don't touch any of the settings. Now, if you remember their bass <laughs> sound, it's like extremely loud, distorted and trebly. Well, that just yes. didn't work. It, it ruined our whole set. We were just all you could hear was the whole bass. It was it was one of the low points of music. Wow, <laughs> that's hilarious, though. It, nice. It, it was good fun. So, in retrospect, so then, <laughs> now now, how do you figure out Gavin Blair's got a voice? Um, you know, because he was a drummer. You know him as a drummer. Well, I'd heard him sing. Uh, I I forget where. Um, I, well, I heard him do Pirate Love with X-Men, but that wasn't exactly a good example. I heard him, we did something in studio. We had a, like a little uh, production studio at the radio station and uh, went in there, recorded something that wasn't suspects. It wasn't, I don't know. I don't really remember, but you know, Gavin's got a nice voice. He's got a nice voice. Yeah. So, okay. So, you, so when you, when you're kind of forming True West, you knew you didn't want to be the singer? Or, uh, well, I or, didn't have the confidence and, and, and stuff. Uh, at that point in time, yeah, the whole story was is people were left or were asked to leave meantime. And we're kind of with a, a lineup that changed its name to True West. And then um, we nudged out the lead singer and brought Gavin aboard. And uh, then we started, uh, yeah, and it, started to focus more on my songs and the songs that I was writing with Gavin as opposed to the previous lead singer's songs. And uh, then it evolved from there. You know, you know all the bass players and drummers. And uh, when we I, added Richard on guitar, that's where things really came alive. But, but we had actually recorded Lucifer Sam and some of the EP before Richard actually joined. Um, mm. So that's actually Steve Wynn making a lot of that guitar noisy noise on lucifer sam okay yeah now that you mention it uh i can hear i can definitely hear that that i mean uh because this this record i mean uh, i think i pointed out before it's it sounds like it's just in the red like it's really loud and fuzzy yeah you know we did it to eight track and uh you know i think it was actually yeah you know you get that compression that you get from tape and this room where we recorded, it was in the basement of this house, as Gavin was saying, and, you know, the walls were brick, and and so you get, you know, this amazing guitar, this real mid-rangey, uh, reverberant uh, guitar sound, and when Richard got his high watt in there, the, you know, then the place really went crazy, you know, it was it was a great place to record. Yeah, bringing up Richard, I, I, I said this before, but he was obviously more seasoned a little older than you guys yeah you he's he's about how, five years older than me and four years older than gavin how did you find him like how did he hook up with you you little kids uh, he, he had always been my local guitar hero he was in this band uh, mumbles and before that permanent wave permanent wave uh did a single on bump and and uh then they kind of transformed into mumbles and richard was just you know the the guy, he didn't play fast, but he was amazingly melodic and uh, could do a lot of all, all your favorite British guys he could do. And plus, he could play guitar forward and make it sound like he was playing backwards. So, you know, hey, need to have this guy. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, no, he definitely enhanced the band. I mean, he's, oh, he's incredible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there wouldn't be True West as we know it without Richard McGrath. Has he... Uh, 
I don't want to jump ahead too much, but sure. did Richard continue playing after? I know he did the full killers with Gavin, but you know, like, does I don't he play now? He, Do you know? No, I don't think he played out. I mean, he uh, occasionally we. Uh, I've had him do a couple little tours of the Northwest with me and and we did one two, three years ago and uh, one maybe five years ago where, you know, we do just around the Pacific Northwest. He doesn't really like to leave home too much. He's pretty much a homebody. He's kind of got his home recording studio set up and he does a lot of instrumental stuff. And uh, that's 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 Richard. No, fair enough. Not Mr. Social. Richard has never been <laughs> Mr. Social. And he used to carry a revolver. Well, actually, it was an automatic in his guitar case. Wow. wow. <laughs> Which was nice because we played in some, you know, some pretty shady areas sometimes or had to be in some pretty shady areas. So, you know, it's nice to have a guy that's packing. Jesus. Did he have to use it? No. The only time okay. I really saw any use is we were, uh, we stopped alongside the highway out in the desert somewhere and we're popping off at some cans, but uh, that was it. Um, no, he didn't even use yeah. it on Prince when he uh, walked by us on the sidewalk at, uh, when we were getting out of 7th Street entry one night. Actually, here's a, a good remark about uh Prince, one other time that we played there, went to the booker of the same guy booked both the big club and, and 7th Street Inch where we were playing and told him how impressed he was with Richard McGrath's guitar playing. So, wow, that's a that's a plus. <laughs> that's, that's testament to Richard. Yeah, I know. I mean, you know, Prince is no, <laughs> is, is, was an amazing guitar player himself, so. I was always scared at the 7th Street entry, uh, Russ, being in that dressing room that was like underground at the very back of the club. I don't really remember it. I kind of <laughs> remember the out, outside and I remember the stage, but I don't remember the dressing room. Yeah, it was behind the stage and it was underground. So if something happened at the front, like you're, there's no, <laughs> you're trapped. <laughs> there's no, there's no escape. Yeah. But uh, every that's, day uh, you're great... taking your life into your own hands being a touring musician. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Hey, Russ. Russ, I have a question about guitar playing uh, with you and Richard. Sure. So how would you guys work out your guitar parts? Would you come in with your rhythm and then he would just work out leads? or uh, Sometimes there would be a, a part, a reoccurring thing. Um, it depends on the song and who wrote it. Sometimes uh, the songs that Richard and I wrote together, he would have some riffs and chords and stuff. And so those would kind of be the, the bones of the song. And I would add some melody and... and uh, lyrics and maybe a, a part or two here or there but as far as the uh it was all by feel mostly you know it was a lot of jamming we were doing and i kind of saw my role uh is richard can play politely and i think my role was to piss him off so that he uh you know that he got uh so it pushed him to uh play at his level and so, you know, I was, I was the noisemaker. As one reviewer in Sacramento, when we we're starting out, said that I, I was just a drone meister. So it, anyhow, it, it kind of worked, you know, the, the, the two things together. Um, nice. Yeah. Yeah. He's still my guitar hero. Yeah, definitely. How, how many, uh, so bring out your dead records, Russ. You had to start your own label. Um, yes, didn't we all? <laughs> Did you, <laughs> Especially did you try to shop it around? Yeah. No, did you try point, to shop? Yeah. No, at that point, it was sort of, uh, you know, the, the whole template was put out your own independent release, get some attention, you know, and see what you can build from there. And that worked. I mean, we sold on our own quite a few thousand copies of that. Um, we'd, we'd sold pretty much through the single, which I don't remember how many we pressed to that, maybe 500, maybe 1,000, I don't know. And then we did... Uh, Two or three pressings of of, uh, of a thousand of uh, of that EP uh, before we even went out and toured, and then I think we did a few more, and then it got picked up by New Rose and blah blah blah. Yeah, speaking of the New Rose, is this yeah. cover was this was this your idea? We had no idea. It just showed up. You know, I used to go to we had a PO box in Sacramento, and so I would drive over to Sacramento and check the PO box and. And there it was, and I went, <laughs> okay. And you know, in retrospect, I think it's 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 genius. But at the time, I was scratching my head really hard. 
Those Frenchies, yeah, and, uh, they, they know something. Right, and they expanded it. They made it like a yeah, full-length album. Yeah, they gave us basically. some dough to go and record three more songs. We went back to San Francisco and uh, to uh, Army Street Studios. Dead Kennedys had actually done some of their singles at that studio, too. There was, there was, there were some famous people in that. Nice. <laughs> nice. Hey, I've always been curious, because you... you you did uh, and then the rain on this, and then you you did it on Drifters after. Wh which version do you like better? I like the Drifters version better. Um, I think, I think at the time, you know, people liked the first version better, and it's faster and rockier and rougher. But uh, you know, listening back, I think, you know, Drifters came out very smooth in comparison to our other recordings, and so I think it left a few people cold. Um, and only going back, my only, I, I think the album's great. My only thing I would change is maybe the eighties drum sound, but other than that, I think it's a really great record. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, I agree. I, I prefer the slower version too. I, I think, it, I think it fits the song. Yeah. It's I more mean, dramatic it's, and yeah, it's beautiful. It, it really is. Thank you. Um, solo so, by so, me. Yay me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You got to point that out when you can, Russ. Yeah, I know. When, you, when you're in a band with Richard McGrath, right? I know. Well, I used to get all the credit. It was sort of like the the Tom Verlaine, Richard Lloyd thing, where Tom Verlaine would always get credit for everything Richard Lloyd did. And Richard Lloyd did most of the coolest melodic lines that you think of as television. It's Richard Lloyd, it's not Tom Verlaine. But anyhow, I, I, I would get that too in the press. And so, you know, I'm sure that probably pissed Richard off. But uh now hopefully he gets his due because he he was really he really is the guy right well you were the songwriter so that's why you got the credit yeah. probably yeah. Yeah. yeah and the and the mouthpiece i like that you said that about television because i thought the same thing when i finally saw television i was like oh my god richard lloyd is he, he you know they're both great don't get me wrong yeah he's the guy are. like he's the yeah yeah i even like the new version because jimmy rip has richard lloyd's parts down at. yeah no no he plays he plays he plays you can tell how important richard lloyd is by jimmy rip what he does i actually yeah. took some guitar lessons from richard lloyd here about three four years back um it was an interesting experience via skype um oh, well, okay. i had we had put out one of his records we actually didn't put it out we distributed it through interstate uh back in the day i don't think he remembered that when i was having my guitar <laughs> lessons with me i mean he knew about me and and uh having done stuff with verlaine with true west but i don't think he remembered that i was the guy that uh got we got great distribution for the record we got it out everywhere and then all those returns came flying back in oh. about a year later. <laughs> so i'm glad he didn't remember me <laughs> listen to that you guys russ is still trying to get better on guitar taking taking guitar lessons even three wow. years ago richard May, richard I'm, is a is a he's a savant uh richard lloyd uh he's, yeah. he's got his whole tree you know his he pulls in mysticism pythagoras uh the you know the double helix of of note relationships and how that uh relates to dna He's got the whole oh universe <laughs> sussed out. And he showed me his sitar. He pulled it out and started playing some for me. So, you know, it was it was worth it. I, I don't think I retained any of the uh, lessons, but I still have the <laughs> notes and I can go back to them someday and actually learn that stuff. Wow. He told me that I is... need to learn some discipline. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. Like John Clayton was telling me, John used to be in Richard Lloyd's band in New York in the 80s. And he said, even when Richard was a totally smacked out junkie, he still rehearsed, practiced every day, learned new stuff, had all these music books. He was just so into being the greatest guitar player he could be. Yeah, his book, his book is tremendous, by the way. Yeah, if, I love that book. If nobody's read it, yeah, yeah, his autobiography. Is, all, is especially all read. the sex parts, that's... Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything Okay, wins. thanks, Richard. Uh, <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> nice um so so um after the ep uh you guys are looking for a deal you end up with tom Verlaine in the studio yeah was, what was happened that... was emi america came sniffing around and uh there was this guy a and r guy there named steve Rabalski, who um was also at the same time managing Verlaine on the side i don't know whether that was formal or informal or how that 
worked with his job with EMI, but uh, Tom had been looking around for somebody to produce and uh, he kind of looked at the Dream Syndicate and said stuff about their guitar playing that I won't repeat. <laughs> and and uh, so he, uh, you know, he came out and saw us at Danceteria and uh, we hung out. And uh, a few weeks later, uh, we were at Bearsville Studio, upstate New York, and uh, living in the barn there. And there would be this, I remember looking over the corner and there was all this PA equipment that said, uh, oh shit, what was, what was Chaz Choplin's Full Sail Boogie Band? Uh, Jazz Joplin's oh. band, Full Tail Boogie Band, because, you know, Albert Grossman, who owned Bears, Bearsville, managed Janice. And so her band equipment was still there. What's it, you know, 20 years later? There was all this yeah. stuff, you know, and then Gavin relayed the story of uh, Grossman at the uh, at the Coke machine. <laughs> God, oh, yeah. Who is this old hippie <laughs> filling the Coke machine? He said, <laughs> oh, you know, Al, call me Al. And then I saw Don't Look Back for the first time. Um, like a week or two later in New York City, and there was Grossman, you know, this really malevolent almost person there, just who really could control people and situations. And what a contrast with this kind of gentle old ponytailed hippie that uh, was <laughs> filling the Coke machine. <laughs> and I also must mention, um, our, our, we were in studio, we were in the big room, but uh, NRBQ was in one of the other rooms doing a record. So we got to hang a little bit with them and the DBs were working on a record in the other room. So mm -hmm. what, a, what wow. a great experience for a bunch of youngsters. Yeah, yeah. And, and so EMI paid for this. this they paid for this. Demo. Yes. Okay. And uh, I think we we're going to do four <laughs> songs and we ended up only being able to finish three because as as Gavin was related, Joe was having a little bit of tempo problems, and uh, yeah, Verlaine did want to bring JD up, but JD was not the drummer in the waitresses. That was Billy Ficka from television, but we did play with the waitresses later and talk with Billy about you know our experiences with Verlaine, and he was kind of like, oh okay, <laughs> like he didn't really care. <laughs> <Right. laughs> oh really? Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh... So that leads you to, okay, the EMI passes on the- Yeah, demo. EMI pass. So that was, uh, you know, early 1984 at that point. We did the demos in 83. Uh, so we said, gee, you know, uh, you know, th that was back in the days where I felt like if we didn't have something going on, like for a month, I felt like it was the end of the world. You know, you know like no patience, no confidence at all. So um, I just said, well, we, we just got to make another record. We have to make an indie record. So Jim- records uh passport pvc had been sniffing around so we worked out a deal with them with marty scott and uh not marty stewart but marty scott <laughs> and uh and you know he was actually despite what gavin says marty was actually for a music business guy pretty straightforward pretty good and uh you know it's funny when you're in the music business and you know you're like 20 something you know you have one idea of what the music business is where it is and then it, as you stay in it a few more decades, you get some more perspective and more knowledge as you know, Ronnie. And uh, yeah. so if you jump out in your twenties, like Gavin did, uh, you know, you, I think you still have this, this idea of what the music business is and what people are. And a lot of that is just, I don't know, it's cliche really, I think, but uh, yeah. you know, you find out more as things go on. So uh, we made that record and it came out in uh, 84 and then we, Meanwhile, you know, somewhere back in 83, uh, we went to the New Music Seminar in New York, uh, me and our manager, and uh, that was the equivalent of South by Southwest kids. And, wow. <laughs> and so we went there and uh, we got hooked up with, uh, there was a company called Singer Management. Frank Riley was the agent and he's now uh, high roads touring up in uh, Northern California. But anyhow, Frank had all the bands, you know, had DBs, Dream Syndicate, uh, blah, 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 all those in violent films, all those indie bands of a certain level. And so Steve Wynn went to bat for us and said, hey, Frank, you got to give these guys a break. So, uh, you know, he put us together on our first tour in fall of 83. And that got us all over the East Coast a couple times. And, uh, you know, and then allowed that whole thing with Verlaine to happen all by the end of 83. So it was all a very busy year. Then we uh, got in the studio in 84. I think spring, 
uh, right after the Dream Syndicate finished their album at the Automat, we moved to the Sandy Perlman space there. And we didn't wow. use Sandy Perlman, but we got the engineer. Uh, what's his name? Paul. Paul, 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 what's his last name? Look on the record. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what am I, Wikipedia? Um, uh, and, Paul, Paul Man Mandel? Yeah, Paul Mandel. Yeah, great guy. Uh, he had been a stockbroker, became a, an engineer, and then I think he went back to be a stockbroker after you know a decade or two of being an engineer. But yeah, we did the record. Uh, Jim, Marty, Stuart, Marty Scott. Uh, <laughs> damn, you got me doing it now. Uh, I know, I know. Yeah, gave us a bunch of dough to go out buy new equipment, which was nice. And we hit the road and we were, our first tour when that record came out was 11 weeks long. And then we came home for a week or two and then went out again. And we were just constantly on the road from uh, like September of 83 through about July of 85. There was very, li very little time at home. Gavin was talking about having a, a day job. I don't ever remember him having one of those things, but uh, <laughs> I did, during that time period, I definitely didn't because there wasn't really any time to, uh, to do that. We were always back out again. I think that wore on us. So 85 comes around and we're supposed to go to Europe. And uh, about three days before we're supposed to step on the airplane, we get a call from the booking agent there in England. And he says, oh, a bit of trouble. Your work permits haven't come through. And England, especially then, was very strict about you having work permits. And they had this whole thing where you had to join the union because there was some sort of exchange program between the musicians union there and the musicians union here. And they go one for one exchange, blah, 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 blah. So long story short, we decided to get on the plane anyhow with no work permits. And we get... Uh, we get over there and we're ass tired and jet lagged and we were supposed to have a gig that night i think we were um we were opening for the long riders at the mean fiddler well we couldn't do it because we and it was going to be videotaped for a whistle test um and you know we were going to be on whistle test and this is our big our big deal uh didn't happen because we didn't have our our uh, permits and Whistle Test was very hot on the Paisley Underground at that point. If you go on YouTube, you can see their two-part thing on, on the Paisley Underground. And uh, so, you know, uh, we actually got interviewed, but, you know, Gavin and I, but we were just so tired and so pissed off that they couldn't use any of the interview stuff. And so, long story short, we went off to the continent, did our dates in, in Holland and Germany and uh, Scandinavia and uh, France and then we came back and the work permits were ready for us and so we could play dates in the UK but we've been rescheduled to play in the studio on whistle test but it turns out you need a special work permit for that and uh -huh. our agent didn't get that in time and so <laughs> it totally screwed you know and we we had meetings uh, you know Christmas was falling us around we played in Brighton and opened up for Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. And I didn't get to see them. I saw their slam trip, but I didn't get to see them or hang out at all because the a &R guy from Chrysalis, you know, took us, took me out and manager after a lot of drunkenness and Indian food. And, uh, but yeah, uh, what, what was my point? My point was, is we ended up being able to do all the shows in England, but, uh, you know, Island uh, ended up passing on us. It was a funny story. Uh, I had a meeting with uh, Chris Robinson, who was one of the partners along with Jake Riviera in Stiff Records back in the day, you know, Elvis Costello, yep. et cetera. Um, he was running Island at that point. And so D we're Dave Robinson, with Russ. Huh? Dave Robinson. Dave, Dave Robinson, Robinson, right? Thank you. Yes. Thank yes. you. Uh, so anyhow, he was running Island at that point. So we're in his office and, and uh, he says, you know, this... This whole Paisley thing, it really reminds me of pub rock. You know, I had Clover on the tarmac. And as soon as they hit the tarmac, you know, that Johnny Rotten spit in that journalist's face. And then pub rock was over and it was punk rock, you know. And he, and so I was trying to convince him that, well, we got to move now. And, you know, <laughs> we have lasting power and all that stuff. And what the funny part of this story is I met Dave again years later. 
And uh, so I told him that he had absolutely no memory of you know, me uh, being in his office or the span true west <laughs> or anything, but it was, it was pretty funny. He is a, a nice, hilarious guy. He's, he's really funny. Yeah, I mean, if people don't know, the Paisley Underground was was very hot in the English press as well. So, so yeah, we all got you know, our 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 week on Enemy or Melody Maker or whatever. Sometimes post in front of the same tree in Hyde Park. I I know Long Riders and us both have. If it's not the same tree, it's a very similar tree in Hyde Park. Right. So so missing out on that big Long Riders Mean Fiddler gig. I mean, that would have been like tons of. In addition to the whistle test, that would have been yeah. The, the the A and R guy was saying, "Oh, just jump up, grab your guitar, just jump up on stage with the long wires." And I, I was not going to do that. That's their gig. I'm not going to just you know, you know. They probably yeah. would have been okay with it because we, we were pals with them and had played you know with them. But I just you know, I I didn't have that much in the way of balls. Right. <laughs> yeah. The, the Paisley bands all got signed to the English versions of the, of Island. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like Rain Parade and yeah, they are all signed to the English part. Yeah, yeah, that's so. that's 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 what they wanted to do. And we had uh, Ian Matthews, the the famous Fairport Convention folk rock mm -hmm. guy. He was an A and R guy for Island at that time, and but he was here in L A. and uh, he was our guy here. And then there was a guy uh, in uh, England came named Captain Nick. I forget Nick's last name, but uh, yeah, they were kind of behind the whole whole thing nice yeah I, I like you mentioned touring russ because i said this to gavin but i remember as a kid in houston i it seemed like you guys played three times a year uh it's possible uh, definitely for twice. a couple of years there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. we were and you uh, know, we were overstaying our welcome i'm sure i i don't re did we play there with rem i don't remember you did i was about to say yeah i saw you with rem a place called cullen auditorium in university okay. of houston um and uh, I don't remember that one at all. I remember Austin and I remember the last one at Fort Worth at Bronco Billy's Bowl, Bronco, the Billy Bronco Bowl. Bronco uh, Bowl. Yeah. Yeah. That was uh, Bronco Billy was uh, George, Ma uh, George Jones manager at one time. And he was the guy that started the Bronco Bowl. So, yeah. So every band that opened for REM has nothing but good things to say about how they were treated. So oh, yeah. I'm sure it's no different. Yeah. Great, great guys. I mean, we played 40 watt in, in Athens and that's where we met Peter and he invited us back to his house and then long night of drinking and, you know, playing 45s. And then I ended up in the, in the guest room and he had these metal wardrobe racks and he had hundreds of those ruffled shirts that he used to wear. So he must have gone into every thrift store across the country and bought every ruffled shirt that <laughs> he saw and he had them all stowed away. Uh, but yeah, the, so the, Robin Hitchcock was supposed to be their opener and I guess he got sick. And so they called us up and said, hey, would you like to, like to do the shows? And so we started off um, Western Canada, Calgary, Edmonton, uh, Vancouver, and then worked our way down the West Coast and through the Southwest. Uh, in California, uh, the promoters were saying they didn't think that we were good enough draw, so they added three o'clock to the California shows. And then after we were through in Texas, um, I guess three o'clock did the rest of the country with uh, with those guys, but they weren't. Uh, they were on the California shows, then not on the Southwestern shows, and then they were on just with REM later on for the rest of that. Uh, Tales of the Reconstruction Tour. And, and Jeff, we should point out your t-shirt you're wearing here. Yeah. Representing, there you go. REM, REM. <laughs> Good. I have a Tales of the Reconstruction uh, t-shirt, uh, tour shirt. Uh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah, I don't wear it. It now fits <laughs> me again, so uh, I'm happy to say wow. that. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Hey Russ, so so about this time you get a deal for Bring Out Your Dead Records uh, to be distributed by Enigma. Like how how did that come about? Uh, because of Twenty Eighth Day, I well maybe I had the deal beforehand. Um, you know, Steve Wynn had gotten a uh, P and D deal, or now they're called manufacturing distribution deals if they even <laughs> exist anymore, uh, with Enigma for his down there label. And uh, so we followed suit and got one, or I followed suit and got one with, uh, with them as well. And so, uh, yeah, we did 28th Day and uh, I don't remember who put up the money for that. Um, and uh, then it uh, was going to become an LP 
uh, because they needed that for licensing in Europe. And so we did three or four more songs for that and uh, ended up on some major labels in Europe. I'm trying to remember what it was. I think it was on Virgin in Greece of all things. Well, that's right. And yeah, some pretty amazing stuff. Um, yeah. No. Well, they got the True West treatment. They expanded the EP into a LP. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I guess the Europeans <laughs> were buying EPs, so. Now, was there anything else on Bring Out Your Dead or, or was 28th Day? No, was we it? wanted to sign this band called Rebel Truth. They were a punk band in Sacramento. Really good songs, a really great band, uh, but we could never convince them. And uh, by then, you know, we had our own troubles. <laughs> right. Which, which leads us to the next phase, Russ. So, so the, you, how, how does the, how do you, you leaving True West, how, what, how does that well, come about? Well, the way it happened is we all got sick of each other and, you know, a lot of touring and a lot of, you know, little bits of disappointment, a lot of disappointment, you know, kind of, get, you know, back in those days, you really couldn't make a living as an independent artist, which you maybe can do today. Back then, the, the template was you get the major label deal or, you know, you get the big deal and then, then, then you can then you can make it. Well, we were so close to getting the big deal a few times that that, you know, that wears on a band. And, mm -hmm. you know, and being young, you don't have a lot of patience. You don't have a lot of understanding. And so, you know, we just kind of basically got tired of us and tired of each other. And while all those guys were fairly good friends with each other, I was kind of the outsider, you know, because I, you know, the, the manager was my girlfriend and blah, blah, blah. I was actually the manager of the band. She was the front person for that. But, you know, I, 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 most of the ideas came from me. And so if they weren't working out, then maybe, you know, I should have been fired as manager. Um, but yeah, so what happened was uh, they said, well, we just don't want to do this anymore. We're breaking up. So broke up and then all of a sudden, uh, I see that they're playing under an, an, another name, uh, Truman, something Truman or something. And then they start playing as True West. And I go, hmm, you know, I, I've put about 20 grand of my own money into this band. And uh, I am the only original member from when True West started. I think I have rights to the name uh, and I certainly want to protect my investment. So you know, I went to court and, and sued them and we had a, a settlement out of there so that they could use the name and get signed on to the CD Presents label in San Francisco and do Hand of Fate. So it wasn't the evil manager, it was the evil Russ. Ah, uh, okay. So it was not, it was not a, uh, a nice split at the time. No, but, it uh, wasn't. It was not. Uh, and for yeah. a while they were, you know, paying my rent in LA and it was, it was good. It was a good deal for a couple of years until they finally, uh, you know, until they finally threw in the towel and, uh, uh, right. you know, pulled the, pulled the umbilical cord off of me, the financial umbilical cord off of me. Well, uh, yeah, after that, you, you made this record. This came out pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, it, split. It, it did. I um, recorded that in Davis in 1986, and it came out uh, on Demon Zippo uh, yeah. that same year. And then when I moved to LA in summer of 86, uh, Steve Wynn was very busy with Dream Syndicate, but he still had down there and wanted to sign bands and stuff. He had the deal with uh, Enigma and he said, hey, why don't we become pa partners in down there and you run the day to day and, uh, you know, and I'll do A&R. And I said, great. So uh, we signed up a bunch of bands. The ones that uh, actually sold the best were Top Jimmy and the Rhythm Pigs who most LA people know Top Jimmy, famous yep. in a, a Van Halen song. And that sold really well for us. We did uh, a band from England called Doctor's Children. That was so-so, you know, but these were back in the days where you could put out a, a record and it was pretty easy to sell a couple few thousand copies, um, you know, because there just weren't that many people writing out records yet in, you know, 1986, 1987. Um, we tried to sign the Pixies. In fact, Steve and I, to this day, say, hey, we're responsible for the Pixies because if we had signed them, no one would have ever heard of them. 
but I, I remember the demo tape. They had the demo of, uh, you know, the man song, whatever that is. I'm waiting for my man. Or uh, here comes, here comes my man. man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, and also Mojo Nixon at one point <laughs> um, was. I think Mojo Mojo was uh, sniffing around with Steve before before I joined with Steve, and and uh, you know they ended up not doing anything together. But you know, there's. Uh, it was fun doing down there. I was going to graduate school at the time, and uh, and then doing, you know, down there between what? steady. Now, Russ, these, were these songs written for True West? Uh, One of them was for sure. Uh, Galveston Mud was written for True West, and there's a demo version of it that I hear has surfaced and is going with Gavin singing, which is going to uh, be on the new set. And I, I, somebody tells me there were other songs too, but I don't remember which ones. <laughs> but there, I think they are in the archive. Um, our most current True West drummer, Jim Huey, is um, our archivist and second historian. Ronnie's our primary historian, but <laughs> Jim is secondary Northwest Edition uh, historian, I... and uh, he's he's helping Pat pull together all the goodies for uh, the new set. Yeah, let, let's jump ahead. True West uh, reunites. And uh, was it 2007? Good question. I think 2006 was the first Something time. like that. Okay. Yeah. And then yeah. we, yeah. How'd that happen? You guys bury the hatchet. How does this, how does this come about? Did you get an I offer? Think Huey, or you Huey actually mended our fences, I think. What happened was uh, I met Huey over the internet. Uh, you know, Huey and Pat Thomas were, were contemporaries in Rochester back in the day. And they're both drummers and they're both very competitive, or at least Huey was very competitive with Pat. And, uh, but anyhow, I get an email from Huey somewhere in the late nineties. And he said, you know, I, I, you know, we kind of became friends over email. And then he said, well, you know, I'm working on this record, which eventually became this thing he put out called Girls Say Yes, which was pop songs that he'd written, some of which he sings, some he has other people sing. And I would come up there and help him produce it. And so he would fly me up and we would spend a weekend in the studio. And uh, I eventually ended up recording a record up there in Portland too because of it. But Sneaky Jim, he gets J uh, Richard McGrath to come in and play some guitar on this record. And so here Richard and I are together and hanging out. And Gavin lived not far, he lived in Salem at that point. So, you know, we're all ended up, you know, in Portland. And I think I'm trying to remember our first show up there. It was definitely in Portland. And uh, we, did a, we did a few True West reunion shows in the Portland area. What, one or two were IPOs, others we just did. We did one with the Windbreakers, we, they came out and uh, Don Dixon and Marty Jones. Uh, Actually, Marty wasn't there, it was just Don. Uh, so yeah, uh, we, we did those shows. And then uh, at that point in time, uh, as Gavin was saying, the Bion Femmes were old pals of ours. We'd played shows with them back in the day. And I know Brian Ritchie was a big fan. He's a the total television nerd. He's he's like a deadhead for, the tel for television. He will follow them around to every show that they do. So at that point in time, when I had the label, uh, Brian plays this Japanese flute called the Shakahachi. And he had done this record with Billy Ficka television on drums and some other actual jazz type musicians. And it was called Shakahachi Club NYC. And it's a brilliant record. And uh, he was shopping it around. And so we had this label at Interstate called Weed where we put all the weird stuff on. Um, so ended up putting that out on weed and uh, we had a guy doing our covers then who used to work for for blue note he was the head of design of blue note and so he did a great blue note style cover for it and uh it didn't sell great but uh you know brian came over to the warehouse and played shakahachi for us and and then uh somehow we just started uh, opening for the violent femmes whenever they come through town so we did a couple film wars and we did uh, house of blues where that DVD was recorded and uh, it, was, it was good fun. And then after the last show we did with them, that was when Brian sued uh, the, the Femmes in, in, uh, in federal court to get his share of 
songwriting that he supposedly thought he had. Wow. Hey, Jeff and Soraya, I'm pretty sure this is the first mention of a Shagahachi in all the episodes, yeah. correct? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Okay. Yeah. That's great. The There's first, also right? banjo on there. Banjo, shakahachi, drums, and tuba, I think, if I remember. It's a really good record. Search it out. Uh, shakahachi wow. Club NYC. Uh, what else was I going to say? Oh, yeah, actually, I think after our last show that we did with them at the Fillmore, then within a month or so, I heard about that lawsuit. And then, you know, the films weren't touring anymore. And now, the last couple of years, I see they have toured some again. So they must have uh, settled their problems. Yeah. <laughs> Brian lives in Tasmania, by the way. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, he moved wow. down there, married a, a woman from that part of the world, and they built a house there in Tasmania. Crazy. It is a crazy world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. So, so you do the reunion, any, that was just kind of a fun thing to do. Did you, did you want to pursue more maybe at well, that we, point? Or we actually kinda... ended up going yeah. to Norway. Um, there was a promoter there that, uh, you know, that we played for back in the day and that I did solo shows for named Kai Yara. And he's always been a, a big fan and big supporter. And he used to do this summer festival called Down on the Farm. And so it was an outdoor thing and, and, you know, people camped and all that, that kind of European style festival like they do in England a lot. Um, and, it, and it's in the town of Halden, which is right by the Swedish border, just south of, of Oslo, about an hour south of Oslo. And um, turns out it was very heavy rains that summer. And so they decided, well, we better do this inside. So they got an indoor venue for it. And then it turns out the weather couldn't have been better. It was in the 90s. And, you know, <laughs> there are guys walking around all over with no shirts on. So now from now on, whenever my wife and I see a guy without a shirt out on the street, we go, Norway. <laughs> and they're also having a classic car uh, thing there, too. So there's all these people driving around in these old American cars. And what was amazing is that I didn't realize that some American sedans and such were sold under entirely different names in Europe than they were here. Uh, I, I wish I could think of an example, but uh, I, was yeah. a little, I was a little shocked. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah. I guess circling back to the Kickstarter, True West is available to perform if you, if you, yeah, we'll even that rehearse on the Kickstarter. We'll, so. we'll even rehearse. <laughs> we'll, we'll all converge. <laughs> on, we used to converge on Jim Huey's basement and rehearse there, but now that Gavin doesn't live in the, in Oregon anymore and Richard's still in Seattle. Um, who knows? Maybe we'll do it to, in LA or we don't know. Yeah. Well, maybe me and Jeff and Soraya, we chip in, we hire True West. There you go. We'll yeah. see what Learn those songs. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so we did want to say so when this posts, there you definitely have at least a few more days to get in on this Kickstarter. Okay. So they'll have eight days. To have eight days. You got eight days. Now, operators are standing by, <laughs> and you'll yes. get this. If you call now, it's a Martin. <laughs> uh, uh, what is this called? A coaster. It says okay. Martin and Company, established 1833, Nazareth, Pennsylvania, America's guitar. <laughs> My personal <laughs> collection. I have a Taylor wow. one as well. See, right. Us is selling his personal things to try to make this happen now. This is fantastic. It is. <laughs> so it should be noted. It should be noted that as of today, the moment that we're speaking, the Kickstarter um, has uh, it. The goal is sixty-seven hundred, and right now there's uh, fifty-six, fifty-seven, a great number. So we're getting close. But by as you're hearing this, go donate to this campaign. This is something every a completist a music fan or just merely a russ tolman and gavin blair fan they need they need yeah. this in their collection and i want to hear this demo I, <laughs> me too it's been some time and and <laughs> also hand of faith the record without me is actually a great record it's got matt pucci guesting on it uh, from rain parade and chuck profit uh, not that richard really needs the help but uh they add to it and <laughs> it's true. never been on cd before and there's also going to be three extra cuts that were not on the vinyl. So uh, it's, uh, yeah. it's going to be fun. Yeah, it's good. I'm glad that you, uh, I'm glad this is going to be on there, Russ. Like, you know, 
And the obviously you have a what? history with this record that might not be, you know, but anyway, it's a good and, thing. And I think, I think the first two full, uh, Pat's talking about putting the first two full killers singles, which have never been digital uh, on, on this as well. So uh, wow. that, that's something it's going to be the complete story of, of true West and yes. where we evolved to and, and where we came from, from the primordial soup to uh, crystallization <laughs> and then. Yeah. And if the folks either. don't know, the, the folks don't know full killers was the group with, with uh, Gavin and Richard after true right. West. Yeah. Yeah. Did a couple made singles, made a couple, couple records, albums. couple singles. Yeah. Great band. So Russ, in 2022, the band will be celebrating 40 years, right? Yes. I know. It's amazing. And I'm only 39. How'd that happen? <laughs> uh, yeah, 40 years. Uh, so, you know, we're talking, we're talking, well, maybe we should go play some shows. And, you know, so we'll see. Uh, Richard's got a pretty good case of tinnitus as as well as I do, but um, I, I did. I do too. Yeah, yeah join the club. Uh, <laughs> yep. It doesn't bother me too much, so I'm I'm lucky there. It doesn't drive me crazy. It's just like oh, crickets. There's always crickets, but uh, so I was doing a little hand holding with Richard, and hopefully he gets uh, you know gets past his so that we can go out and do some playing. So assuming that everything goes well with the Kickstarter, and I'm sure that it'll be a success. We need your we help. Have? now yes yes we're about on, 83 84 percent of the way there but the last 15 percent is probably the hardest so please folks yes yes i think it'll be done by the time this airs by the way i yeah. think it'll be i think it'll be paid for by the time uh, but i, I think it's possible that... yeah yeah go go check it out you need to be in on it either way so uh what are we looking at for a release date is october there any kind of time frame? October. october and okay. uh I was going to mention that the guy who engineered Hand of Fate uh, for the guys, um, he's now a master in engineer in San Francisco, who I use all the time, called named Gary Hobish. He is actually going to be mastering this record. So it's sort of like a full circle wow. for, for Gary. And he actually has all the, the digital uh, files of, of the... Uh, the stuff that was going to be on CD, and then they ended up never doing a CD. So that was okay. you know, back in the eighties, where not everyone got a CD re release. Right, right. So, are we looking at distribution for this? Will it be able to? Uh, yeah, I think we'll get it out. Um, I had a distribution deal until like a month ago. Uh, there's this distributor up in Bay Area called City Hall Records that I've worked with for years and years, and uh, they did my last two solo things and uh i got a nice little email from them saying well we're downsizing and bye bye <laughs> so uh yeah P pat's got some ideas and you know once once there's finished product it's, it's easy to get people to uh to sign on and 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 put it in their shops and and distribute it uh but you know now's the time you got to get in on the on the early stuff because by the time it's out in the stores you know it's old news but you know, you can be one of the cool people by joining in now. Absolutely. Yeah. Which you guys already yeah, have. So you're the coolest of cool. <laughs> and I can't help but notice, Russ, behind you, there's looks like there's a Pro Tools session open. Uh, yeah, it's not Pro Tools. Uh, that's actually the console from uh, uh, Universal Audio. Uh, their okay. their uh, interface, the the Apollo over here. And right. uh, yeah, so it kind of looks like a board. Um, they have a new uh, recording program, a new DAW called Luna, which I like, but I, I'm so invested in uh, Cubase, which is where most people in the US use Pro Tools or Logic or something. But I started using Cubase because uh, Chris von Snyder uh, of pop fame, uh, Flying Color, et cetera, he, uh, he gave me a bootleg. Uh, a pirated copy of oh. Cubase years ago. And so I just started using Cubase. And then I actually ended up and bought several versions of, of the real deal. So don't send the, the, the police after me. But uh, I was going to say, send them after Chris, right? You just outed him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, you know, Cubase is, is, is cool. Germans and Europeans love Cubase. 
but it, you know, I've got so much time invested in it that I just don't, there's so much it can do that I still don't know what to do with. So why start all over with a new DAW? But I really love the universal audio plugins and their, their interface and stuff. It, it all sounds nice. You, you catch all that, Soraya? You, you take all that in? I, hey, <laughs> I'm like a steel trap up here. That's how you make so what, the magic. What what kind of session is going on with that Cubase? Uh, some new Russ Tolman songs? Yeah, I, I've been working on a bunch of stuff. <laughs> I, I guess right. uh, I've got about half of an album. Um, okay. I got a new song that I wrote with Steve Wynn the other day that I want to get recorded soon. I've also put together a four song EP of me doing Fred Neal songs. And I want to uh, put that out eh, soon. Uh, I was aiming for April, but uh, you know, I still need to do some stuff uh, like get some artwork and stuff. So <laughs> it might not be April, but uh, that's coming along soon. And then the, I'm hoping the album about the same time as the True West thing comes out in October. Nice, very good. After taking 20 years off, good, good, <laughs> yeah. goodbye El Dorado was the first thing in 20 years. It's amazing what getting married and becoming an adult does to you. Screws mm -hmm. up your music career. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Well, Russ, we wanted to thank you for coming on Thanks, and Jeffrey. promoting this Kickstarter program. And um, I definitely recommend anybody listening to this, go to Kickstarter right now, type in True West. I have a long link, but I don't know if there's a shorter link, but Kickstarter dash slash project slash True West will get you there. Um, the long link goes a little bit further. True hyphen West hyphen legacy hyphen three hyphen CD set. We'll get you there, but go to Kickstarter type, type in True West. Yeah, we're Please the user yeah. project. There's somebody doing the Sam Shepard play is trying to mount money for that production. So we're not the play. Good. <laughs> you see a picture Good of four, five straggly guys with you know, kind of big 80s hair, plus Richard, who is just looking much cooler than the rest of us in his sunglasses. Everybody used to think that he was Graham Parker back in the day. <laughs> you know, it worked opposite a couple of years ago, Russ. I remember a friend of mine in New York sent me a, a ticket outlet, had the play True West, had a picture of you guys. I, I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so saw it goes, that, yeah, like in ways. the bands yeah, yeah, yeah. in town and stuff. Yeah, all those. <laughs> I almost booked a flight. I wanted to see True West. I almost booked a flight. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good to clarify. Support True West, the band project. And please make this happen, people, because I'm going to be really upset if I don't get to own this. So. Cool. Same. Don't make yeah. Ronnie cry. Don't make yeah. me cry. I just, yeah. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> All right. Well, Russ, we thank you so much and uh, we wish you the best of luck with thank this you, project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. We're looking forward to holding it in our hand and um, I can't wait to hear what Ronnie has to say when he when he reads through the booklet. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you read it before it goes to print, Ronnie. Pat Thomas. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'll yeah. get you, Pat Thomas. I'll get you, Pat. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway. All right, Russ, <laughs> All right. thank you so much. And Ronnie, thanks again for helping us out here. Thanks, thanks you guys. You, this is where they talk about you. us, Russ, after we sign off. So okay. be nice, we you guys. Bye, we Soraya. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Jeffrey. Bye. Bye thank Bye, you. Bye, I'll talk right. to you soon. Bye, Bye you guys. Bye-bye. All right, Soraya. Wow. You know, we've had Russ on the on the show before. But I learned some new yeah. things to Yeah, me too. Uh, but not just about him and, and his work, but also about the evolution of True West. I am really glad that he was yeah. on, and I'm glad that we have one of the experts <laughs> yeah. to have helped us with this episode. And that thank you again to Ronnie yes, Barnett. Most definitely. Jeff, how much would you give to hear? The suspects doing just what I needed. Oh my cars. gosh! I I feel like I'm... when he said that I that I <laughs> wrote it down. I could. I was like, "What?" I know. I know. And that he played bass in a yeah. polka band. <laughs> How cool is that? But to me, it's really interesting to hear this trajectory. You know, this timeline of True West. So many different. Um, 
influences, um, but also, you know, you and I keep talking about, we keep going back to this underlying foundation of friendship between a number of these bands. And look at, you know, Steve Wynn plays a really pivotal role um, throughout the band's trajectory and at least, you know, throughout Russ's trajectory too, because he gets involved in different in different facets of the industry. And yeah. um, but it's just really interesting to hear this story. Um, and focusing on very, very different things. But that music is what brought the band back together. I love that. Yeah. You know, and I like the way that Russ said it. He said, you know, kind of sneakily. <laughs> yeah. They brought in Richard to play guitar and then Gavin, and then all of a sudden, you know, they, you know, the same time, Feels all you know, with time you move forward and so the band found its way back together and then you know we had these reunion shows that were starting to happen yeah. this you know think of this critical timing the band's about to celebrate 40 years and then we've got this three cd set that we want to encourage everyone i think the lowest the lowest uh, level that that uh, that campaign is looking for is $25. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> if you think about how much uh, buying vinyl or buying CDs or even downloading costs, you know, that's a couple of albums. And look at what you're getting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're getting all the albums, plus the one that Russ wasn't yeah. on, you know, but yeah. True West, plus a bunch of, you know, demos. And who knows what yeah. else is is in that vault yeah yeah i'm hoping maybe some of that those tom verlaine demos end up in there but possibly yes possibly it sounds like it's still a work in progress i think pat's probably still working on it and and here's what i love i love hearing that russ is working on new music too same yep absolutely i knew i knew when you saw that program open it was gonna go there somehow <laughs> i'm glad you asked but half of an album a four song ep and then he wants to complete that album hopefully release around the same yes. time but the expected release of the set is gonna the legacy set. Yeah. so yes listeners yeah. if, if you're listening to us now please go to kickstarter and support true west uh if you yes. want to support the play as well, that's fine, but <laughs> <laughs> please support the musical act, True West, and let's get this going. Get it over the finish line. Let's, it's not already there. And uh, FYI, Jeff and I want to be invited if you're that yes. guy that that uh, contributes at the level where the band comes to your house and plays. We want to be invited. <laughs> we will travel. Have passport, we'll yes, travel. please. We'll bring snacks. Yeah, we'll bring snacks. Why yeah. not? Snacks yeah. and drinks. But we want to be there. And uh, I don't think there's a better time than now to invest in, uh, like Russ said, you know, you want to get in on the ground floor. You want this in your yep. collection. Completist or Agreed. not. And here, here's your opportunity to get, to get their, basically their whole discography, you know, their three albums and bonus tracks bonus tracks think about that vinyl stuff that was only released on first vinyl. time on cd for boom now you get it so i think it's worthwhile i'm with ronnie you know jeff jeff and i have already contributed so we're already yes. in on it but uh we think it's worthwhile and a worthy um contribution to your to your own record collection yes. so um and we'll we will provide a link so that you can take a look for yourself and have an easy way to access it we'll publish it on our, all our social media most accounts. definitely but uh this was a great conversation with russ tolman once again thank you to ronnie barnett um 
He is the expert. I'm I'm willing to go out on a limb. I say he's expert number one. <laughs> I don't know. Jim Huey might might uh be battling for that spot, but well, you know, that, that would be a battle royale. We'll have him duke it out. Yes, indeed. But uh no, this was really a great conversation with Russ Tolman. So thank you once again yes. to both of them for helping thank you us. Both. Mi gente, agroviar, go contribute to the Kickstarter. Groove on, Pacey people. It's a quarter to three. There's no one in the place except you and me. So set them up, Joe. I got a little story you ought to know. One for my baby. One more for the road. In fact, I have a good story about that. Of course. Of course I do. <laughs> <laughs>